Hello, my name is Jan Ketil Röth, and I will in this video talk about representation. Most of the content is taken from the textbook in Norwegian, GIS tools to understand the world. So here is the outline of the video or the lecture. GIS is about representation and there are two main strategies in GIS. Vector for the discrete object view and the raster for the continuous field view. These are covered in all textbooks in GIS, but uh, I will in this video also present representation as a philosophical issue. I will also provide some problems with representation. There are many, but I will focus only on some few of them. And then I will compare the two strategies, the vector versus the raster, and finally, having some concluding remarks. Representation is central to cartography, and the word representation is the first word in the subtitles of Alan McEachran's book from the 1995 Whole Maps work. And also the first sentence in the book reads, cartography is about representation. And very much of the book is about introducing the concept representation as a concept better capturing the practice of map making than the concept mirror or reflection. According to McEachran, the map is not a mirror of the world, it is a representation of the world. So after the Second World War, there were huge efforts by many cartographers trying to establish cartography as a science and the map was portrayed as an objective reflections of reality. The map as a mirror metaphor. This view, however, became contested and Alan McEachran was one of many who advocated the use of the concept representation as better suited for whole maps work as a subjective understanding of reality. So our understanding of the map has been changing and therefore also our understanding of how reality is represented in GIS. How reality or the environment around us is represented in a GIS is a topic covered in all GIS textbooks. Nadima Schulman's textbook from 2004 is not an exception, but she also considered representation as a philosophical issue. The question what can we have knowledge about is an issue embedded in the concept ontology. Ontology is about what exists, what is constituting reality. When we study reality, we never study the reality directly. We study reality through our representation. With GIS, we then study reality through objects and feel. And Schumann says that objects and fields are the only way the GIS users have to represent spatial objects as entities in a digital environment. Objects and fields define the ontological possibilities of GIS. Now representation, therefore, is how reality is represented in a GIS. Reality is complex and no representation can represent reality entirely. To be able to represent something from the real in a GIS, it needs to be reduced to either discrete objects or continuous phenomena, two strategies known as the object and field view. In the environment around us, there are several geographical phenomena. But for these to be able to be represented in a GIS, we need to be able to conceptualize these as either discrete objects or continuous phenomena. In principle, both raster and vector can be used to code fields and discrete objects, but in practice there is a strong association between vector and discrete objects and between rasters and fields. So the two main strategies in digital spatial representations are therefore vector data, 
which is points, lines, and polygons, and raster data. So continuous means that the phenomena is everywhere. There is a set value for any location. So this is uh, an example showing here of elevation in Trondheim, ranging from minus 1.9 below sea level up to more than 565. So all the examples are temperature, air pressure. For any location, we have a temperature, we have an air pressure. So discrete objects, on the other hand, means that they are not everywhere. They are at specific location, and between them, there is empty space. The example here is showing layers from the detailed common basic vector data series in Norway called FKB, showing here several layers from Trondheim. A layer with point representing waste water facilities, such as outlets and manholes, a layer with polygons representing buildings, and another representing the space occupied by roads. A layer with lines representing contours, and finally, a layer with polygon representing water bodies, such as lakes, large rivers, and the fjord. These are just five examples of a multitude of layers available in the FKB data, and it demonstrates another quality of how GIS represents the world, through a series of layers put on top of each other. So more about the discrete object view. This represents then the geographical world as object with well-defined boundaries in an otherwise empty space. The geographic world is literate with object which belongs to a category and can be counted. These are two central qualities of the discrete object view. They belong to a category and they can be counted. The category could be roads, mountain peaks, lakes, and we can count them, for instance, by kilometer of the road, the numbers of peaks about 2000 meters, and the numbers of lakes. And of course, this becomes problematic because one category can be difficult to separate from another. For instance, if you are about to count the numbers of lakes within a municipality or a county, what is actually a lake? It's something different from a pond and a smooth part of a river, but it needs to be well defined to be able to be counted. And often it's problematic to draw a boundary between categories. It's less difficult in a built-up environment for a man-made structure, but but categories in nature, it's become more problematic. So an idealistic situation where there is a clear boundary between the forest and the scrub, between the scrub and the grassy plain, it's often not so in reality. Often these are categories which are mixed. A second problem relate to counting. For instance, what is a mountain peak? And this is a photo showing a mountain and it has several peaks. So how many peaks should you be counting here? Also related to counting is that a mountain peak per definition is supposed to be visible. So if it is under an ice cap, it does not count. There are many who, who is collecting numbers of peak about 2000 meter and Gallupigen is the highest mountain in Norway and one which is very attractive to reach. And some few years ago, because of global warming and the melting of the glaciers, this little peak here become visible. And it's about 2000, so it's now being counted as one of the peaks in Norway, about 2000 meters. So Norway has got a new 2000 meter peak. The characteristics of the vector and the raster representation will be covered in other videos with more details. In this video, I will, however, do some com comparisons about the two strategies. And when GIS was first developed, the early GIS, they were all raster GIS. They were based on raster data. And one reason for this was that computing was 
easy, such as when doing overlays. Because if the rasters you want to combine, if they have the same coordinate system, if they are well aligned and have the same cell size, overlay was very easy. For vector data, however, the same operation is very complicated. For instance, because all intersections between crossing lines need to be identified. And it took some time before it was successfully implemented in GIS. And still, you may experience that doing vector overlay will take much longer time than doing raster overlay. For vector data, however, adding information to entities is very simple. Here we have a model of reality and there are two polygons representing two different types of forest. And if you want to add description or add properties for these polygons, you simply add a new field, a new column in the athletic table. For instance, if you, in addition to forest type, want to bring in information about the logging class, you can do so easily just by adding a new field. And you can go on with that, adding uh, properties of the age of the forest stand or the growth rate of the forest stand. So this is done very simple. For a raster approach, however, since you only can have one value per pixel, you need to have a new layer for a new property. So a new raster layer for growth, one for age, one for logging class, and one for force type. While in the vector data, you may have four fields in the attribute table, you will need to have four raster layers. Now, I come to the concluding remarks and will return to the writings of Nadim Schumann. She writes that every system of representation is fundamentally limited. The English alphabet, for example, comprises only 26 letters that in combination are often assumed to be able to communicate all concepts to all audiences. It is well known, however, that many ideas, feelings and intuitions are not well advanced through written text. GIS, likewise, works within a constrained system of representation. So according to Schumann, all representations are wrong, but some are useful. Vector and raster representations in GIS are also wrong, far from complete, but this has been proved over the decades that they are very useful.